politics can be best understood by looking at the derivation of the word poly, of course, from the Greek for many, tick from the English colloquial for small blood-sucking insect. If you think about the political process as eight billion small blood-sucking insects, each trying to suck out the life juices from the other while defending oneself, you understand something about the political process. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. A new world order is emerging, and in our Global Macro series, I, along with my co-host, Jim Kassan, want to dig deep into the minds of some of the most prominent experts to help us better understand what this new global macro and commodity-driven world may look like. We want to explore their perspectives on a host of game-changing issues and hopefully dig out nuances in their work through meaningful conversations. Our guest today is one of the most sought-out people when it comes to understanding the global natural resource shift that he sees coming in the very near future. And he's also a wonderful educator with plenty of fun stories to share. So please enjoy our conversation with Rick Rule. Rick, welcome and thank you so much for joining Jim and I today for what I'm sure will be an incredibly eye-opening, fun and insightful conversation on all things commodities. Where do we find you today? Hopefully somewhere nice. Uh, I'm at home in Anacortes, Washington, which for your global viewers is sort of equidistant between Seattle and Vancouver, BC. And in fact, it's a lovely spring day, uh, unusual for the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> that does sound nice. Now, Rick, since this is your first time on our podcast, perhaps I could ask you to set the stage a little bit and provide a bit of context for our conversation by just sharing a few highlights from your background, perhaps some of the things that have had the biggest impact on you and what led you to where you are today and why you actually ended up focusing on commodities in, in your career. I'm a retired uh, investor and speculator uh, and also an entrepreneur who has been involved in building financial services companies, banks, insurance companies, wealth managers, asset managers, primarily around con conventional financial services and more importantly, natural resources. I have focused, for better or worse, on natural resources and commodities-related businesses since breaking into the business world in 1975. Uh, as I say, I'm retired now, which means I'm working sort of 45 hours a week as opposed to a more hectic schedule. I, I failed former retirement. Uh, and I'm principally involved now in uh, ed educational uh, activities around conventional activity, uh, around investments, a although I'm also involved in starting a new bank, something that I recommend to all retired people. It's a wonderful activity. This will be my seventh uh, de novo bank involvement, and I'm having just a tremendously good time with it. So thank you for asking. Sure. No, absolutely. Now, before we leave your journey completely, I have heard you before and you mentioned uh, just now the word speculation. And, and I've heard you say on, on other podcasts that you have made your money speculating wildly, um, which sounds very interesting and, 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 and even fun, uh, although it might be gut wrenching at the same time. So I was wondering if you could maybe share one or two stories of these kind of life changing bets that you've been involved in. Sure. Do you want both the good ones and the bad ones, or do you just want the good ones? I'll take whatever you give us. I, I've got plenty of both. Um, investing, if that's the right phrase, allocating capital and natural resources becomes more risky the farther down the production scale you go. Uh, and I spent 20 years of my life primarily engaged in financing exploration, uh, which may be one of the riskiest businesses known to humankind. When I was in 
university in natural resource finance, uh, I, I was taught by my professor, it may or may not be true, but he said it was true, that about one in thousand, one in 3,000, pardon me, mineralized anomalies became a mine. So the headline opportunity set around exploration financing is that you're taking a, a one in 3,000 chance of a 20 to one return, which makes the lottery look like a fairly good deal. Uh, I learned over time that you could reduce your risks by employing Pareto's law, which is to say by understanding that certain earth scientists, certain geologists were spectacularly more successful than others. And I learned that by concentrating my efforts uh, around teams that had been serially successful, particularly serially successful in uh, exploration terrains that were similar to the ones that they were currently working, that I could change the odds uh, substantially. I would say in terms of, uh, in terms of stories, uh, I had the incredible good fortune in the 1970s to uh, help raise capital for and finance a couple of very odd financier promoters, Hughes and Lang, who discovered half of the fabled Hemlo deposit in Canada, which ended up being uh, a 30 million ounce deposit and was uh, eventually sold. If my memory serves me well, uh, the initial financing level was something around 30 cents, uh, and the takeout that occurred uh, later in the decade was somewhere around $50. You know, there was good news and bad news around that. The good news is, of course, that I aspired to be a capital capitalist, pardon me, but at the beginning of the process, I didn't have very much capital. Uh, after that happened, in fact, I was a capitalist with capital. The bad news is that I came up in the business in the 1970s, enjoyed a couple of successes, but I confused a bull market with brains. Uh, the fact that the gold price went from $35 an ounce to $850 an ounce. The silver price went from a buck and a half an ounce to $50 an ounce. The oil price went from $3 a barrel to $30 a barrel. I had wind in my sails, but as a young man, I chose to believe it was all my brilliance. In the early day, in the early 80s, when commodities prices collapsed, I learned just how experienced and just how smart I was, which is to say, not very. <laughs> I guess the second anecdote, the second tale I'd like to leave you has been that in addition to taking headline risk, which is to say technical risk, I've taken a lot of political risk. Uh, I have been involved in countries, extensively involved in countries that many people couldn't spell, uh, often for good reason. The uh, crowning success, I would suggest, with political risk was really a headlong move into Congo so-called Democratic Republic of the Congo, beginning in 1994 uh, and ending about 2000. For your younger viewers who have no memory of that, uh, or for people who were too smart to be involved in Congo, uh, the period 1995 and 1996 were tumultuous, to say the least. There was a civil war in place where about 2 million people died. On top of that, there was malaria there was AIDS, there was Ebola, there was good old-fashioned starvation as a consequence of the fact that goods don't move well during war. It was, to say the least, an interesting time to be involved in a country that wasn't a country. It was an open sore. It was a war zone. The good news about that is that I didn't face very much competition in country. And the best anecdote I have about that is a little company called Tanke, T-E-N-K-E, -E, mining, uh, named after the Tanke Fungurumi uh, copper deposit, which was at the time the largest and highest quality undeveloped copper deposit in the world. I, I would tell you, as I told investors then, that the copper underground didn't care too much about the foolishness of the people above ground. And, and while uh, thousands of people were dying, in and about Katanga and Lubumbashi, the copper didn't particularly care about the foibles of those above, although certainly exploiting the deposit was difficult in a war. Uh, the upside or up the story around all that is that uh, this deposit, Tanke Fungurumi, was in the control of the Lundin family, a serially successful Swiss-Swedish family probably the most successful resource entrepreneurs and financiers of that epoch. So you had the best deposit in the world. 
under the control of the best entrepreneurs in the world because of reasonable fears about the Congo, the stock was selling at 19 Canadian cents per share, and it had 30 cents per share cash in it. It was selling at an 11 cent discount to cash, and you got paid 11 cents to own the best copper deposit in the world with the best entrepreneurs in the business in front of you. The equation to me seemed very simple. There was a strong possibility, perhaps not a probability, but a strong possibility if you bought the stock for 19 cents, that you would lose 19 cents. If, however, circumstances in Congo changed and the Lundines were skillful enough and tenacious enough to hold on to the project until the end of the war, it seemed to me like I could make $5 a share. So the risk to reward juxtaposition was losing 19 cents or making $5. If you assume that there are equal probabilities and you can afford to lose the 19 cents, you need to take that bet uh, or else you need to work for the post office or do something else for a living. I took the bet and in truth, I was wrong. The stock didn't go to $5 a share. It went to $17 or $18 a share. Uh, markets always overshoot in both directions. But I would say that's an interesting, interesting story. And the third story, if I haven't worn you out, was in a sense more dramatic financially for me. Uh, I made the fourth or fifth largest score of my career on a mistake, on a blatant fraud. A very good investor employed uh, a man who was a superb geologist, a reti retired uh, exploration executive, mineral exploration executive for a major U.S. oil company. And this consultant went out to Indonesia to look at an alleged gold deposit, came back from the trip, uh, called me, then his broker. Uh, and said, I'd like you to sell everything in my account, including half a million dollars worth of the stock of the major oil company that he'd worked for, to put all of the money into a penny dreadful exploring in Indonesia. Uh, after I gave him a lecture about the fact that he was a complete and total fool and shouldn't do this, uh, when he persisted reminding me whose money it was, I said, okay, well, if you're that convinced and you're that smart, First of all, why don't you let me structure the investment and see if I can't put it in with a private placement and get you a warrant? And why don't you let me tag along? <laughs> if you're going to put your whole net worth into this, you know, I'll put two or 3% of mine and I won't make you sign an idiot letter to do the transaction. And so we proceeded. I called up the people behind this company. I arranged a private placement, which included, of course, this erstwhile geologist, myself, and some of my closest, most foolish clients. And... That company was Briex, uh, which turned out to be the biggest financial fraud probably in the history of the mining business. We, if my memory serves me well, financed the company, or rather its sister company, control company, Bresse, at a dollar a share with a dollar and a half warrant. Uh, and at its peak, that stock sold for $280 per share. I had the extraordinarily good and in, in, in unexplainable good fortune uh, sometime before the fraud blew up to question my investment. First of all, the CEO, David Walsh, now deceased, appeared at a conference that I was uh, sponsoring. And for his appearance, which was unfortunately after lunch, he was so intoxicated that he couldn't speak. I mean, literally, he was speechless. Uh, that gave me pause about executive direction. The second thing is that the purported size of the deposit was so large, 80 or 90 million ounces, supported by all the best analysts in the world, that this fake deposit attracted the attention of the Indonesian government. And I didn't know whether the Indonesian government would steal some or all. The market capitalization of the company by this time was seven or eight billion dollars. Uh, and it was difficult to establish a valuation because you didn't know how big the deposit was. You didn't know what the fiscal terms were. You didn't know what the start date was to construct net present value or free cash flow analysis. But I did know that this deposit of unknown size had a market capitalization higher than Freeport Copper and Gold which was at that time paying an 8.5% dividend. I, I had the extraordinary, extraordinary good fortune in September of 1996 to come to the realization that I wasn't rich enough to own 
that company and that my reputation among my clients was not, although it was stout, stout enough to subject them to the risks involved in owning a company led by a drunk uh, of unknown size, unknown start date, unknown capital in a country that was actively trying to steal the deposit. And I began the process of selling very aggressively. The fact that it was a fraud was completely, completely unbeknownst to me. Uh, I, I need to say that my timing was good enough that I was visited by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Ontario Securities Commission, the FBI in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. And I told them all the same thing. You know, they said, when did you know? What did you know? How did you know? And I said, all I knew is that the market capitalization was bigger than Freeport Mac Moran. I didn't know the start date. I didn't know the provenance of the deposit. And I didn't know how much the Indonesians would steal. So I hope that those three examples will give you a sufficient background on the improbable nature of my fortune. They, they certainly explain the world speculated wildly in your career, that's for sure. Now, I have heard you speak on a, a number of different podcasts over the years, and I will say I do walk away learning something new or being inspired to think about commodities in a different way. Uh, and I think a lot of people around the world may not previously have given much thought to the topic of commodities, but may have changed their mind and appreciation for this in the past year or so. So we've got quite a lot of, to uh, of ground to cover. And um, I'm going to start by throwing out kind of a broader topic that is not specifically commodity related, but fits into the bigger regime. Um, that also relates a little bit to sort of where we are uh, in the economy. So maybe... From your perspective, perhaps you could talk a little bit about how you see the interplay between economy, inflation, commodities, and perhaps compare, you know, where we are today, and maybe comparing it with some of what you've seen, um, you know, through the decades that you've been involved in this. Well, certainly commodities as a part of the economy are unusually cyclical, unusually volatile, and unusually capital intensive. There are other businesses, uh, I'm thinking retail food distribution, groceries, <laughs> or banking, that are much more sensible businesses. They're blocking and tackling uh, businesses. To be successful in the commodities business, you need to be an instinctive contrarian. Uh, the truth is, to speculate or invest in commodities, if you're not a contrarian, it's highly likely that you will be a victim. The commodities either bore you or torture you for long periods of time. Uh, and then they make up for that period of boredom and torture with spectacular returns over short periods of time. It is very difficult to time commodities, though. There's too many things that get in the way. And if you don't have the patience to understand that a market has to go up, uh, but you will never know when the market is going up, if you don't have the patience to invest in things that are inevitable but may not be eminent, you miss the first part of the move, which might mean that you miss out on 50 or 60 percent of the move. So you have to be patient, you have to be tenacious, and you have to be a contrarian. If you're not, give commodities a very, very, very wide berth. The commodities businesses in my lifetime, I'm 70 years of age, have had two periods of real outperformance. The first was, of course, in the period 1969, 1970 to 1981, that epic bull market that saw almost every commodity you can think of raise, uh, go up by 10 times and some commodities going up by 30 times. That was mercifully uh, and unmercifully when I broke into the business. As I say, I confused that bull market with brains, much to my chagrin later. The second bull market, uh, I think, really began about the year 2000 and ran through 2011. Concurrent with two things, we were coming off 20 years of underinvestment in natural resources, so we had capacity constraints, at the same time that we saw the economic miracle known as China, uh, the urbanization of China. Uh, and so we had a demand pull uh, coming into a supply crunch, and we had another great commodities boom. The excesses of the 1970s market 
caused the commodities bear market of the 1980s and 1990s. The uh, successes of the commodities bull market in the decade 2000 to 2010 has caused, I would suggest, the bear market that we have endured in the period 2010 to 2022. My suspicion now is that we're coming into another commodities bull market, really as a consequence of systemic underinvestment by society in natural resources, coupled by the ascent of humankind. It's important to understand the demographics of natural resources and the demographics of natural resource economies relative to other economies. When any of the three of us make more money, the goods that we buy, the things that have utility for us, are not very commodity-centric. We might buy, I don't know, some little product from Apple, you know, a $1,000 product that weighs, you know, 100 grams, 300 grams. There isn't much stuff in it. Uh, the truth is we all have too much stuff. We could probably improve our utility by pay, taking a bunch of the stuff that we have now and putting it in a landfill. But when the poorest half of humanity get more ability to consume, more ability to spend, the things that increase their lifestyles are extremely commodity intensive. Their stuff, when poor people get more money, they go from barefoot to having shoes, from shoes to a bicycle, from a bicycle to a 50cc motorcycle. And from that to a Toyota Hilux, they go from a mud and wattle hut to cinder block with a steel roof, and they use lots more energy. We've done a great job uh, as humankind in the last 40 years, raising up the poorest of the poor, taking 2 billion people out of dire poverty up to the part where they're just poor, uh, converting uh, the world from a world where 3 billion people had no access to primary electricity to the part where a billion people as of today have no access to primary electricity. And all of that has taken resources, taken stuff, taken energy. The chore now for the next 20 years uh, is to look at a billion, uh, pardon me, a billion people on earth with no access to electricity and get them some electricity, uh, lifting up the poorest of the poor, which is materially intensive. At the same time that we're doing that, we are facing declines, production declines, uh, in a wide variety of natural resource products, those same products that sustain our lifestyle, never mind the lifestyles of the poorest of the poor. So my suspicion is in the next five years, absent a synchronized global recession or depression, that we will run into a supply crunch uh, and we will run into a supply crunch across a wide variety of extractive industries. Oil and gas, uh, despite that noted energy physicist Greta Thornburg's wish uh, that oil and gas would go away, certainly copper, perhaps cobalt, perhaps zinc, a, a wide variety of mined and extracted products are, at least in their markets, facing production shortfalls because of a systemic underinvestment in exploration and productive capacity. If you add on top of that, the fact that there are now 8 billion of us on earth, all of whom would like to increase their material living standards, it's classic economics, increased demand, reduced supply. It has an interesting impact on, uh, on prices. The fly in the ointment is this. We've gone for a very long time, a very long time, without a recession, in particular, a major recession. And you can have reduced supplies if you have reduced demand. <laughs> they balance out and prices don't increase. So people who are listening to this getting hot and horny uh, about a, a billion Indians coming into the resource market need to understand that in the near term or the midterm, uh, a recession could dampen the price expectations that I've set you all up to expect. I will tell you, too, that uh, inflation while it's very bad for humankind, uh, increases uh, often the relative performance of commodities because they can go up in nominal as opposed to real dollars. Uh, it's important to remember in the decade of the 70s that one of the things that happened is that the cost of establishing productive capacity in capital-intensive industries skyrocketed, which made the value of existing productive capacity that had been installed before uh, inflation hit the supply chain, all that much more valuable. One thing that inflation is, is a barrier to entry for new entrants, which makes the value of established productive uh, capa uh, capabilities 
much higher. And inflation, too, uh, if inflation isn't accompanied by higher interest rates, or even sometimes when it does, uh, is wonderful for the price of precious metals. Gold uh, classically does well when people are concerned about the maintenance of purchasing power in other forms of savings and investment assets. Inflation in the fashion that we're seeing now in a period of persistently low interest rates, although not as low as they used to be, drives those concerns. If you look at the economics as an example of the U.S. 10-year Treasury, the primary savings, savings instrument in the world, but sorry for the American-centric comment, but it's true, the arithmetic that would attract people to gold is very evident. In the U.S. 10-year Treasury, the U.S. government uh, promises to pay you 3.75% or something like that every year for 10 years in a currency that the Congressional Budget Office suggests is declining in terms of purchasing power by 7.5% a year. So you take the 3.75 that they propose to pay you and you subtract 7.5. <laughs> what you see is that the U.S. government is solemnly promising to reduce your purchasing power by almost 4% a year compounded for, for 10 years. My friend Jim Grant calls this return-free risk. I would suggest to you, first of all, that this is the first promise that my government has made me in my 70 years on Earth that I'm confident that they will keep. And it tells me, too, that it is likely that gold can win a war against return-free risk. It tells me that the nervousness that savers might have around the efficacy of an investment that promises to cost them 4% of their purchasing power compounded over 10 years is probably a challenge that gold is up to over time. So I hope uh, that's helped discuss the interplay between commodities, investments, precious metals, and the economy at large, particularly, I think, the political economy. If, if your listeners believe, uh, A, that there's going to be a synchronized global recession or depression, uh, they probably need to emphasize industrial materials and commodities less. If your listeners believe that governments around the world uh, are going to allow interest rates to rise to free market levels or constrain their spending, their quantitative easing, by the way, quantitative easing is government speak for counterfeiting, uh, or control their spending, uh, I think they probably should ignore investments in gold and silver. Uh, I, particularly with regards to the latter set of circumstances, governments controlling their spending, governments allowing interest rates to rise to free market levels, or the resumption of positive real interest rates, I, I don't believe any of those things will occur. But if I did, uh, I would shift all of my emphasis to conventional banking and insurance investments, and I would forget uh, about natural resources and precious metals. Rick, this was uh, this was wonderful. Uh, it gives us a lot of things to uh, to talk about. Um, so, uh, Jim, why don't you uh, go somewhere that you've been uh, <laughs> wanting to go here with Rick? I could just let listen to Rick talk. I, I really don't, <laughs> I almost don't want to interrupt him. Um, to be honest, uh, yeah, it sounds like you've had an incredible wealth of experience. Uh, again, I can listen to you go on about some of those stories at the beginning. You mentioned your early confusion of skill for luck, right? Uh, I think we all go through that. I've been in this business for 25 years. I definitely, I started in 98 in, uh, in, in the Evol space, you know, as a market maker. And uh, definitely that very much changed my view on, uh, you know, and it took took me about 10, five to 10 years to unlearn some of those things uh, and to really get the bigger picture as well. So I think that's something that all uh, investors go through. Um, but one of the things that uh, you also mentioned was 69 to 81. And you kind of compared that to 2000, 2011, both great periods for commodities, very different reasons in my opinion you'd probably agree for why you know to some extent uh the things worked uh, very different periods right one was a very inflationary period uh one was not i think you, it sounds like you you would agree that this period is probably a little bit more like 69 to 81 in some respects although you get the uh you have the the underinvestment uh right uh on the supply side like 2000 2011 it, it almost sounds like you're getting both um, in, in some ways at the same time. Uh, that's I a common ask, theme yeah. I, I need to point out. That's a common theme. The bull market in uh, 1970 to 1981 uh, also coincided 
with 30 or 40 years of underinvestment in productive capacity, stemming back to the Great Depression, going through World War II and coming into the post-World War II boom, where uh, industries that were more glamorous than natural resources commanded the attention of the investment community. So I think that one of the, one of the themes that's current in resource bull markets is they come off decade-long or two-decade-long or three-decade-long periods of underinvestment where demand for resources consistently outstrips the supply of resources available to distribute. But otherwise, you're correct. Yeah, I couldn't. I absolutely agree. I think some of the, um, you know, something else. <clears throat> excuse me that I that I would pick up on during that sixty eight to eighty two period. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Is you know, periods of inflation are not just times of uh, it's a, being harder to fund right investment and and increasing the barrier to entry, as you mentioned. But it's also they tend to be times of resource scarcity uh, because of uh, populism. Right, uh, populism is usually what drives these things. You have more wars during these periods. You have more conflict uh, historically during inflationary periods. Really, as a result of populism being local, right, and capitalism being international. So when everybody kind of goes to trying to feed their people, uh, they're less concerned. Uh, you know, everybody's scrambling over scraps and bits to make sure that they have what they need, which ultimately leads to, uh, you know, it's almost an animal instinct, right, to, to uh, competition uh, and eventually war. Uh, I'd love to hear your kind of thoughts about that. And if you have other uh, other add-ons that you think might be interesting to this period. Well, my response will probably generate a lot of hate mail. Uh, from your listeners, uh, but that's okay. They're your listeners, not mine. Publicity is good publicity. <laughs> so let, let them hate. Um, I, I think that uh, inflation is primarily uh, a political phenomenon. Uh, I think that most people around the world, I including those who believe in democracy, tend to vote for free beer and a free lunch. I'm reminded of two quotes uh, around politics, one from H.L. Mencken, and I'll paraphrase it. Elections are basically advanced auctions of stolen property. An election exists in the minds of most voters to extract benefits that they believe they're due to while defending themselves from the extraction of their neighbors. That goes to a wonderful definition of politics. I don't know who the author was, maybe Mencken too, saying that politics can be best understood by looking at the derivation of the word. Poly, of course, from the Greek for many tick from the English colloquial for small blood-sucking insect. If you think about the political process as 8 billion small blood-sucking insects, each trying to suck out the life juices from the other while defending oneself, you understand something about the political process. Artificially low interest rates, as an example, are a political phenomenon. Why on earth would you, as a saver, want to forego consumption now in favor of your neighbor's consumption while taking a credit risk around the fact that the neighbor might pay you back. This is not a normal and natural phenomenon. What negative real interest rates are, are a political phenomenon. It's part of a war by spenders on savers. Spenders are far more numerous than savers. And in a democracy, <laughs> that uh, larger class wins. Two, the idea that you, as a group, spend more money than you have and burden your children or your grandchildren with the costs of your consumption is something that is uh, more easily done at the societal level rather than at the family level. The idea that you can burden future generations who aren't your own spawn uh, makes running up a uh, hundred trillion dollar aggregate liabilities for a country like the United States, much more easy to stomach. I, I know that sounds like a fairly harsh prescription, but when I talk to my own audience in the United States about the fact that we have $32 trillion in on balance sheet obligations, 26 net of counterfeiting, uh, net of the Fed's balance sheet itself, but that we have almost a hundred trillion dollars in net present value of unfunded liabilities, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and that we're dealing with this debt. Uh, we're servicing this debt from a budget that is itself 
$2 trillion annually in deficit, people's eyes glaze over. Uh, when they say, we need this, we need that, we need something else, you know, I need to say that uh, everything that you believe that you need is putting a burden on the unborn. How do you feel about eating your children's and, and your grandchildren's legacy? It doesn't register because the people who vote for this stuff believe that they're burdening somebody else's legacy, not their own. Uh, and it's useful to engage in discussions like this, even as both Republicans and Democrats uh, may disagree fairly vociferously with me. It's very useful for them to keep the issues in mind and debate it with themselves. <laughs> I think, you know, <clears throat> to your point, uh, you know, a, the counter argument to that, and that's just really to be polemical here, is in a fiat system, it's not a closed system, right? At the end of the day, you, uh, you're you not necessarily, I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm just you know, making the argument here, it's borrowing from your side, uh, Rome taxed all of its provinces for a thousand years to pay its debts, right? Um, to, to keep feeding its people internally and, and hence grew. Um, yeah, again, international listeners, well, you know, there's a, uh, will eventually, you know, catch on the, the world will eventually catch on to this. Right. Uh, and, and the question is, uh, will they be able to exert enough power? Uh, but it is power at the end of the day. And I think that's the big takeaway. It, it increases conflict as you go down that road, uh, and, uh, debtors relative to borrowers, you know, uh, to lenders. You make a wonderful point. Uh, Hayek said, uh, that there's a lot of ruin left in a country as great as ours. Uh, and we can uh, finance this idiocy. We can kick the can down the road for a surprisingly long time. Uh, I'm an optimist about humankind, humankind even in the United States, which I know the best. It still remains a culture where uh, six young geeks can commandeer a garage in Sunnyvale, California, and out pops Google or out pops Apple or out pops Facebook. We have been able since the New Deal, uh, to have a society where our individual genius, tenacity, and creativity has been able to finance our collective stupidity. And I think that's wonderful. A and better yet, because of technology, because of the distribution of access to tools and the distribution of, uh, of education, that garage doesn't have to be in Sunnyvale anymore. It might be in Accra, or it might be in Jakarta, or it might be in Sao Paulo. So I think that in many senses, the outlook for the world is fantastic because of technology and individual initiative. The risk, of course, is that certain groups of people come to feel entitled. They come to feel that they have the right to exist materially on the backs of others. And it's precisely uh, that feeling that leads first to deficits and then, as you pointed out, later to war. When I listened to you speaking there um, before there, Rick, um, I think it, it, it reminded me of another quote, I think, actually from yourself. And that's this thing about when, when people, you know, wish for affordable homes, they forget that it actually means that their own home also becomes affordable. Um, so so it's, uh, it's a crazy world. Now... We have already been chatting for about 40 minutes and we haven't even gone to uh, come to, to commodities. So I think we're going to be jumping around a little bit um, and I'm going to kick it off and try and talk about things that maybe you don't talk about in the same uh, regard uh, uh, when when you speak on uh, with other people. Of course, the topic that I just want to hear your thoughts about um, is, uh, you know, energy related. Uh, we'll, we'll probably dive into that a bit more. It's also ESG related, which I know you have, um, like before, some, some, uh, some good opinions on. But there was something that struck me the other day, and um, I think uh, I'm sure you've heard this as well, and that is that Vanguard has been out saying some things about changes um, that I think are somewhat uh, ESG related. And then I saw a headline today uh, on in Financial Times where uh, there was one of these iShare funds or um, ETFs that had seen like a $4.6 billion outflow in one day. So do you think actually that this ESG that has been hailed uh, for a number of years as being the 
right way to invest. Do you think something is changing there? Are people starting to question it, do you think, a bit more? I hope so. Uh, I mean, I'm all for responsible investing. It's just that uh, what constitutes responsible, from my point of view, is very different than what constitutes responsible from a collectivist point of view. But let's look at E and S and G. E means environment. Should we uh, turn our backs on the Green Revolution, which has allowed us to feed 8 billion people more cheaply than we were able to feed 3 billion people before? Should we uh, default to uh, organic gardening and increase the labor cost component in food while reducing the productivity of each individual hectare, uh, forcing us to convert hundreds of millions uh, of uh, acres of uh, land, which is now used for more environmental purposes to food production. Is that good for the environment? Should we, in terms of uh, extractive uh, industries, turn our backs on capital intensive, but environmentally safe methods of extraction in favor of artisanal extraction? Let's look at S just for fun, the social part. Uh, how do the big thinkers of the world, Angela Merkel or uh, Joe Biden or uh, Justin Trudeau, feel about the fact that one billion people on Earth have no access to primary electricity? How do they feel about the fact that 300 million people on Earth have calorie consumptions in their house below 1,400 calories per person? Is part of the S equation helping the 3 billion people on earth who experience at least intermittent poverty to enjoy the same relative life standards that the big thinkers of the world enjoy? Let's move on to G just for fun. Governance is the spawning of envy. A useful piece of governance is the building up of debt and deficits, a, a, a legacy of financing future consumption, pardon me, current consumption on the backs of our children and grandchildren. Is that good governance? I'm all for ES and G. I'm for ES and G in a market sense. Uh, I am not for the big thinkers of the world to determine my values or anyone else's values for them or for me. Uh, I've spent 50 years learning something about energy markets. And while I believe that Ms. Thornburg uh, certainly has a seat at the table, I don't take her counsel particularly seriously because I've seen her ilk off before. I remember well the Club of Rome, and I remember well their forecasts of starvation. I remember, too, that the policies that they favored made starvation a foregone conclusion. And the idea that I should burden myself and my neighbors with the foibles of the big thinkers, uh, I think, is really what conventional E, S, and G is about. We're seeing reaction to that around the world. We're seeing people react to 600 private jets fly into Davos and have those big thinkers tell us that we need to drive less. Uh, they tell us that we need to eat locally. Well, there's no food that's produced within 50, 60, or 100 kilometers of Davos. So very obviously what they tell us to do is completely inconsistent with, they, with, with what they themselves do. And I think we're seeing a circumstance now where there is pushback around the politics of extinction. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, the one thing I would add, and, and I, again, just to kind of push back, and I think it's because it's always a, a good conversation, right, um, to push back a bit. You know, we, we spoke uh, with Adam Rosenzweig a couple times. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but, you know, one of the things he talks about is uh, e EOEI, right, and, and uh, the amount of energy on energy uh, efficiency, you know, the reality is, to your point, there are costs, right, to to investing in clean, you know, energy. Um, you know, we built again eight billion a, a, 
a planet with 8 billion people on it based on that efficiency. And, and if you try and go backwards on that uh, or bring in trying to deal with externalities, right, uh, that there's a cost to that. Um, so I agree with that. But the pushback is, shouldn't we think about these externalities, right? There are these uh, costs that we we burden ourselves one another with uh, that, that we don't take uh, into into our, our thoughts. And particularly if they're existential, which, you know, we can debate, uh, but if they are existential, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, th that's going to be a problem eventually if we don't deal with it. Um, again, that's that's just to kind of push back. Now, to your point, uh, both sides can be very vociferous and, and go down the wrong way of dealing with things. And when you put uh, these things into politicians' hands, they never end up the way they should. Um, but uh, but something to – just another voice out there. Let's not be vociferous. Uh, whose children – would they impoverish? And who gets to make the decision? Do they get to make the decision? That's always the question, right? Uh, you know, the problem the problem is getting good policy <laughs> uh, at the end of the day. You know, markets are messy, but they work. Uh, as populations get more prosperous, the environment means more to them. At one level, the environment is a consumer good. Uh, and you will find much more capital contribution to the environment as a consumer good in countries where material existence isn't on the line. I would argue with you that uh, habitat preservation occurs best when people are wealthy. I would suggest, too, that you need to look, as an example, in the energy space at the whole panoply of energy technologies. If you're concerned, as I am, about air pollution and water pollution, uh, and you're concerned, too, about three billion people on Earth who experience energy poverty, I think you need to look at some solutions that include nuclear. I'm not anti-solar. I financed solar uh, installations myself. I think solar is silly in northern Germany where the sun doesn't shine. Uh, I'm not against wind, but people don't like to live in windy places. So if you invest in wind, you need to invest in a grid that can take wind energy from North Dakota and move it to California. <laughs> I note that the largest year uh, on record for coal demand, despite Ms. Thornburg, was 2022. People around the world, including in the People's Republic of California, when they flip the, flip the switch, they want the lights to come on. You'll notice, as an example, that Germany has become much more coal-centric. It would probably be better for carbon if the Germans were building uh, more natural gas facilities or restarting their nuclear facilities. So I very much agree with what you have to say. Uh, I very much agree with the so-called pushback. Uh, but I think that the pushback needs to be scientific rather than narrative. And I think, too, that the decisions need to be made in markets, not by big thinkers. I have zero interest, zero interest in uh, the World Economic Forum uh, or the U.S. Congress to decide the mechanism for my material well-being. It's quite interesting when you talk about these uh, stats and and sort of real life examples about how people uh, on one side you know embrace wind energy and I understand fully why, um, and being Danish uh, by birth, uh, of course Denmark being a big country when it comes to uh, wind technology, it is quite interesting that in Denmark I think it was last year or the year before I think actually 2022 only three and I repeat three windmills on land were set up because nobody wants them in their backyard. So uh, so it is an interesting debate. But but actually, you talk about, you know, um, uh, that you know, uh, you'd say capital should decide, et cetera, et cetera. I did actually pick up another story today uh, on Bloomberg um, with a headline that's saying the amount of equity raised privately by climate startups has dropped 40% from a year earlier. So there seems to be a little bit more of a headwind, if I can put it this uh, way, um, towards some of these things. And maybe that will, you know, spark a debate. 
but we need to move on because we've got so many things to talk about. Um, so one other thing that I've heard you speak about, Rick, that I want to um, just, I wouldn't say challenge you on because I don't think you're necessarily uh, wrong, but but I'm curious uh, uh, about it. Two things. I've heard you talk about that there is in the US, so this is, sorry, I should say we're going to gold now. <laughs> so so one of your favorite topics. Um, I've heard you say that there is a very low US investor ownership in precious metals, um, probably about half a percent at the moment. Long-term mean is about 2%, and it's been as high as 6%. And that might be an indication that we should revert to the mean, so there should be a case for more of a bullish case for, for gold. So I wanted to ask you about that in the sense that, well, n- n- maybe it's, clearly that's the case. These are the numbers. These are the facts. But I was just wondering, could it be just because that there are so many other things we can invest in today compared to where these numbers came from in the 60s and the 70s? Is it is it as simple as that, do you think? Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I think that there is a possibility that Buffett's right, that gold is a pet rock. I think that there is a stronger possibility that for most people, Buffett is wrong. Buffett points out uh, that gold doesn't produce anything. Uh, It isn't intended to. It's insurance, and insurance doesn't produce anything either. If you are Buffett, if you are capable over decades of generating real economic returns that exceed your needs and exceed the market, If you are capable of understanding investments that keep pace with and exceed inflation, you don't need gold. Sadly, uh, after 50 years, I've come to learn that I am not Buffett. Uh, And while he doesn't need that insurance, I in fact do. So I think part of the equation revolves around who you are uh, and what your needs are. As we discussed at the top of the show, Gold has done well during periods of time when individuals are concerned about the maintenance of their purchasing power in conventional savings instruments. And I believe that people are right currently to be concerned that negative real interest rates, which exist around the world, are a mechanism of plundering savers on behalf of spenders. And those programs are extremely popular, ironically, even among savers. If you look at debt and deficits, uh, what what debt and deficits do is they constrain the credit capabilities of the societies that borrow, which is to say they increase the risk of default at the same time that the compensation for that risk uh, is negative as a consequence of negative real interest rates. The reason, and this has gone on for some time, the reason I I think that gold investments are more timely has been the fact that we've been through 40 years of very benign economic climb, and we have been able to A, lower interest rates, while B, affording our stupidity over 40 years. My suspicion is that the tides are changing, particularly for bond investors, particularly for the largest institutional investors in the world who for 40 years had sort of a magic circumstance where 40% of their portfolio could be in long debt, where the negative real interest rate was low and where the declining nominal interest rate raised the capitalized value of their distribution, which is to say the price of bonds. That's all changed. In the last 18 months, we've seen the impact of higher interest rates on bond portfolios. We've seen it all the way from the British guilt investors to Silicon Valley Bank. Now imagine yourself running the Stanford University Endowment, a $30 billion pool of capital that's designed to service the faculty and staff of Stanford University in 20 years, 25 years, 30 years from now. Imagine that your portfolio, and I I don't know that it is, but imagine that your portfolio was constructed on the paradigm of the last 40 years. So it's 40% in long debt. Now, imagine you as a portfolio manager coming to understand that 40% of your portfolio guarantees that you won't be able to make your obligation. The fact that interest rates have doubled lowers substantially the capitalized value of the distribution of a 20-year revenue stream bought during periods of lower interest rate. So the corpus of your trust fund has fallen dramatically. At the same time, 
that negative real yields means that inflation eats away the paltry distributions that you're getting from your bond. What this means is, I think, that you're going to have fairly massive disintermediation. That's a fancy way of saying selling in the long bond, and that that money that money is going to be redistributed to other asset classes. It isn't all going to flow into gold, but I suspect if the concern, the new concern is around inflation, the same way it was in the 1970s, that some of that money is going to flow into an asset that has a historical reputation for providing safety in just that set of circumstances. And that's why I think the market share of gold is so important. As you described, J.P. Morgan Chase has said that the market share of precious metals and precious metals related assets in the United States is one half of 1%. I'm not suggesting that gold is going to win the war against the long bond or gold is going to win the war against U.S. treasuries. I'm suggesting that demand for gold because of negative real interest rates, because of debt and deficits is going to revert to its statistical mean, which is to say 2% market share. If that occurs, demand for precious metals quadruples. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen and precisely why. I've got to ask one more question, Jim. Sorry, but uh, just want to stay on this. Otherwise, I'll, for, I'll forget. And that is, um, you, you talk about demand. Uh, one of the places we've seen demand from recently is central banks. And I've heard people um, say, well, that's a great bullish sign because central banks are buying. But then I'm thinking back on my own career. And I'm thinking, well, I think they were selling at $200 or so uh, a couple of decades ago. So is it such a good time uh, or sign for for uh, sort of being uh, as, a, as a signal? So uh, how, what do you think about this? Uh, that's a that's a wonderful question that gives me the opportunity for sort of, sort of a colloquial joke. My friend Doug Casey said that his experience with central bankers, which I take it as limited, suggests that most of them come from good families and went to good schools. He said, otherwise, you'd see them at 7-Eleven with a mask when they went in. Uh, he doesn't describe them in very charitable terms. I would suggest that the central bankers are buying gold, uh, not so much for the reason that I would buy it, be but because they understand the dilemma that they themselves face. And they suggest that other central bankers are facing the same dilemma. If you are a, an American central bank, the idea that you're attracted to Eurozone securities or Japanese securities or Chinese securities is of low, low uh, interest to you. The second reason, I think, is the weaponization of the U.S. dollar. Uh, I would suspect that the greatest enemy that the U.S. dollar has is Congress. Uh, the idea that they've tried to impose uh, extraterritorially the political preference of the United States uh, on countries like China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, uh, India, countries, Saudi Arabia, that have their own preferences means that we have literally driven those central banks uh, out of the Swiss banking system, out of a reliance on the U.S. dollar, which is still the most liquid and transparent medium of exchange on the planet. In other words, the franchise around the U.S. dollar is something that the U.S. is actively destroying. And the greatest promoter of asset classes other than U.S. dollars and U.S. Treasury securities among central banks, ironically, the greatest promoter of disintermediation around the U.S. dollar is, in fact, U.S. Congress. I think this weaponization is particularly important. Uh, the idea that the U.S. De decided to weaponize the SWIFT banking system has meant that countries that wanted to pursue their own agendas and trade with each other have chosen, frankly, reluctantly uh, to abandon the dollar standard, in fact, in favor of other bilateral or multilateral standards. If I might answer the question for a little while longer, in my prior employment, working for Sprott, selling uh, Sprott investment products to some of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world, I, I remember having the occasion to ask at least three sovereign wealth fund managers uh, why they had such large concentrations of U.S. Treasury securities in their portfolios. Uh, I, I described the U.S. dollar relative to debt and deficits a, a, as perhaps uh, a lie, particularly with regards to negative interest rates. And I will never forget 
one of my counterparties looking at me smiling and saying, Rick, of course what you say is true. But the dollar is the deepest and most liquid lie that we know. Uh, I said, point blank, do you trust us? He said, of course not. But we trust you much more than we trust each other. I, I think the strength of the U.S. dollar in the last 15 years hasn't been so much the strength of the dollar, but relatively the weakness of the competitors. As Doug Casey again says, the prettiest mare in the slaughterhouse. Uh, unfortunately, we've done a superb job of debasing the franchise. And the consequence of the superb job that the United States has done debasing the American franchise is, I think, the reason that you're seeing the proliferation of gold and other investment uh, uh, categories uh, in the central banks of various countries around the world, particularly those who feel threatened by us. Yeah, I'd like actually like to kind of dive in a little bit deeper. I mean, that that phenomenon isn't new, right? During times, um, you know, uh, like this, we, we have resource scarcity. We have cur- uh, uh, big volatility in currencies, FX, bonds. Um, there is, uh, like I said, more competition than cooperation going on. And you tend to have more leptocurtic, more tail outcomes. It's interesting when you look at, you know, gold obviously and silver get looped in with uh, other commodities, but really the way, if you do a historical analysis, the way they perform is very different in terms of their personalities, in terms of uh, their distributions of how they move. Um, During times uh, of inflation, uh, particularly if you look at the most recent 68 to 82 period, you have dramatic volatility to gold and silver, as well as FX and bonds. Their volatility is much more like the currencies, right? Or the treasuries or the FX than oil or other commodities are much more industrial. Actually, ironically, and and what's happened in the last two years is you've seen volatility increase in both, right? Um, But you've ironically seen the, the commodity, the industrial commodity side be actually a bit more intense and demand for that volatility um, be more intense. And, and ironically, during times of inflation, you actually see the opposite. Commodity, industrial commodity inflation, uh, uh, volatility goes down significantly because there is an underlying demand that comes in, right? And uh, I, I call it the oil put or the uh, you know industrial commodity put. Uh, whereas we had a Fed put, which underpinned the dollar and, and you know underpinned interest rates. Now you have a put that uh, essentially underpins uh, industrial resources that have a natural kind of supply side problem relative to demand. Um, and in a time of scarcity, that's more important. Um, given that, uh, and, I, and I know it's a long-winded lead in, how do you find convex ways to bet on um, gold, uh, you know, more asymmetric ways to bet on uh, on what I think is an undervalued kind of volatility? Uh, you mentioned at the very beginning the, uh, you know, your asymmetric bets that have paid off in your career. I'd love to hear what the next one is. Well, I guess there's three ways to look at that. One, uh, I don't regard gold as an investment or a speculation, personally. I regard it as insurance. I own it as a 70-year-old man to sleep nights and stay calm. Uh, And I value uh, sleep and tranquility. I invest in producing gold mining companies where they are competitive in terms of the net present value of the free cash flow, which they could distribute to me over 10 years with other industries. This is separate and apart from an insurance function, because in this circumstance, I'm investing in the probability of free cash flows in the future. I speculate, and let's, let's go back to the investment part. In that circumstance, I look among other things at market beta. Uh, I believe that the gold mining sector will perform competitively against other sectors for the next 10 years, because I believe it's more likely than not that the gold price will go up. And gold mining companies, if you measure them by the value metric of the net present value of future cash flows from uh, on balance sheet reserves and resources at current commodity prices, uh, if you compare that net present value calculation with their enterprise value, uh, their market capitalization plus debt minus cash, What you'll see is that as an investment class, what I describe as the best 12 miners in the world, the universe of the best 12 gold miners, are at the cheapest level that I have seen them in in my entire career. 
So I think they're reasonable investments. If I'm right about the gold price, uh, there isn't much certainty in the investing world, I'm afraid. I speculate, <laughs> you know, I always make fun of speculators, and it's ironic that I made all the money that I invest carefully now by speculation. Uh, I speculate in circumstances where I think my knowledge uh, around the process of exploration, construction, and development exceeds the knowledge of most of my competitors. I look for circulation, I look for situations, pardon me, where there is a possibility or even a probability that there is some increase in value uh, that is unrecognized by the market uh, within one or more companies. I do all three of those. The fact that the gold mining industry is attracting almost no competition from other investors who are smarter and more well-heeled than I uh, is something that I'm absolutely delighted by. What I have learned is that when I am in a sector and I'm very lonely, my probability of doing well is higher. Mr. Buffett says buy straw hats in winter. And with regards to interest in the gold mining sector, we are certainly uh, in the winter, which means because of supply and demand, it is more likely that they're cheap than they're dear. I also have learned that the speculative part of the investment business is extremely extremely competitive. Uh, I compete with younger people who are able to work harder than I, although they might not have my experience. And what I found is in circumstances where very few people show up to compete with me, I can usually outcompete them. Uh, I, I joke that an old, bald, fat 70-year-old like me can win the 100-meter dash if he's the only guy that shows up to run. Uh, and, and I'm seeing precisely that in the gold mining industry despite the fact that I think it's fairly fertile terrain, there aren't very many people settled here, which I love. I am, um, I mean, the time is flying, uh, Rick, so I hope you can stay on for just a little while longer. Um, I certainly have one more question, then I have a, a few things I want to do before we we, uh, we finish up. Maybe uh, you have another round, uh, uh, Jim. But I, I want to ask uh, about a slightly different thing, which relates to, obviously, um, what's been going on in the last uh, 12 months or so. And, um, you know, we came from this world where everybody was happy to trade with each other. And now we're in a situation where the world is deglobalizing. Uh, de and, and what I wanted to ask you is about whether or not there is perhaps a little bit too much hype in some of the narrative, because... We hear things, and these are prominent people, um, uh, you know, making uh, these statements. Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not wise enough to figure out whether it's true or not. But sometimes we hear people say something like, "Well, you know, a company like Airbus, they're running out of aluminum because of Russia." We hear that Russia will kind of lose their production uh, capabilities because. They don't have the Western technology anymore and, and companies to service their infrastructure. I mean, is it true or is it hype? I think it depends on your time frame. Markets always work, but they're really messy. The idea that the Russians have aluminum and the Germans and French need it, that aluminum will become Saudi aluminum or Indian aluminum somehow. Sanctions don't work. Markets work. I think it's true that the Russians need access to Western technology, but Chinese and Indian technology will fill the void if the West is unwilling or unable to fill it. They will not fill it in two years or three years. Uh, they need to develop it before they fill it. But the truth is, despite the best efforts of the big thinkers, markets work. We don't like the fact that markets work because markets are messy and we want predictability. What we want, sadly, doesn't matter. Uh, we have to confine our desires really to what we can have. I, I remember two and a half or three years ago during a period when the oil price was at 10 and $20 a barrel, the big thinkers of the world talking about the end of oil. That presumed that when those big thinkers went outside to their garage five years hence and turned the key to the right, that their car wouldn't start. Markets work. People want to better their material living standards. The narrative always gives way to arithmetic, just not always quickly. It was very clear to me that if the uh, incentive price for oil, including social rents and the cost of capital, 
uh, and the writing, writing down of prior year mistakes was $60 a barrel, that either the price of oil went from 20 to 60 or no one's car would start. What was more likely? When we talk about the lack of access to the British, or pardon me, the European aerospace industry of aluminum, that's something that might occur for two years or three years. It isn't something that will occur over time. If we talk to uh, about our unwillingness to provide technology to the Russians, that could be a problem for the Russians for two years or three years or four years. If the Russians uh, are willing to pay for access to technology, someone will develop the technology to sell to them, whether we like it or not. Yeah, I think uh, last thing I want to say here is I think you bring up a point that we come, you and I come from completely different corners of the world, right? Um, but we, I think we both learned the same things in our career. And I think a lot of other people who have been in this, in these businesses for, for quite some time would agree that uh, there's a reflexivity, you know, like you mentioned, timing can be sometimes very messy. Um, but, uh, you know, as Benjamin Graham said, you know, the short term markets are a voting machine and the long term they're a weighing machine, right? Ra you know, markets can say irrational longer than you can say solvent, et cetera. There's this reflexivity of positioning. Once people know something is happening, it won't happen until you shake those those longs out. And I think you kind of uh, alluded to there's these cyclical effects. Uh, recession may come. You may get a liquidation. And uh, from your experience in commodity markets, which are quite uh, liquid compared to some other markets, you can get some real underperformance for a long time and then it works all at once. And and that's how it works in most uh, most markets. You know, this is top traders unplugged. If I would say to, you know, the traders out there kind of, you know, that's you always need to have a secular conviction to what you're doing, right? But at the end of the day, uh, you need to be prepared that, uh, you know, about positioning and everybody kind of being uh, too far on one side of the boat. Um, I think I've definitely found that in my career. And it sounds like uh, kind of that's something that's very important right now that we're talking about uh, a secular trend, which I would agree with. I don't have much to add to that. I, uh, you know, I, I think I began by saying you're either a contrarian in this business or you're going to be a victim. Uh, it, it's odd that uh, if you strap on particularly an unpopular position and if the position challenges you, which is to say it goes down before it goes up or exposes you to volatility or takes time, it's ironic that when the trade begins to work, when the price rises, that very price rise validates the narrative. Sometimes the price rise has taken out the future net present value of the trade you feel better about the trade because the price went up, but the fact that the price went up is beginning to obviate the value of the narrative. So it's very important to be a contrarian. It isn't merely important to buy a sector when it's selling at a substantial discount uh, to the net present value that the sector will enjoy when the commodity returns to incentive price. It's also important to remember to sell when you're feeling smart, when the price action has vindicated the narrative. If you see the copper price, go from, in U.S. dollar terms, three and a half or four dollars a pound to seven dollars a pound, what happens in your mind is that you feel smart and you feel good. And the fact that the copper price doubled makes the narrative more acceptable to you at the same time that the price action has made that realization less valuable. It's very important to understand that being a contrarian also involves selling once your conviction has proved to be correct. Amen. Yeah, no, I, I, I hope we get some contrarian opportunity in commodities soon. Uh, that would be the holy grail. That's the sweet spot. Um, and I, I have a feeling we might uh, before we before this we, goes We higher. can talk about those uh, on some other episode. They exist today. Absolutely. Would love to. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that there is just so much more to talk to you about, uh, Rick. So I'm sure we will have you back uh, in the not too distant future. And, and, and so because I don't even have time to to give you the the uh, the chat GPT question I got from <laughs> typing in your LinkedIn bio, so I'm gonna keep that as a cliffhanger, um, so so that you will be up for that. Because one thing I do want to do before, um, I mean, I love the fact that you've kind of devoted yourself to uh, education. You you speak a lot at podcasts. You have your conferences, and I know there are a couple of new things, events that are coming up uh, later this year, one in April that's virtual, one in July, which is both virtual as well as 
physical in a wonderful place, not very far from the headquarters of the company that I work for. Um, so I wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, to talk uh, a little bit about what you have uh, in store for uh, those who want to learn more, so to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, I am very involved in education, uh, which is something that I enjoy a lot. Uh, and there are three things I'd like to talk about, talk to you about. <clears throat> Any of your listeners who have enjoyed my comments on natural resources, but want to have a conversation that's more focused, are invited to go to my website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. If you list your natural resource stocks there, I will personally rank them one to 10 and comment on individual issues if I believe my comments might have value. Please no crypto. Please no tech stocks. Please no pot stocks. Confine an old guy to what he knows. Ruleinvestmentmedia.com. I'll rank your natural resource stocks. If you are interested in our educational products, we do uh, investor boot camps around natural resource commodities. We did a uranium boot camp. We did a silver boot camp. Now we're doing an uh, uh, electric and battery metals boot camp coming up in April. I'm happy to tell you more about that. You can, again, question me, uh, rick at ruleinvestmentmedia.com, or you may be able to post links to it. Uh, finally, we are having an in-person conference. I think it might be our 30th annual conference. We took time out during COVID, obviously. This is in Boca Raton, Florida, in July 23rd to July 27th at the wonderful Boca Resort. Uh, a resort, by the way, that charges you $1,100 a night per room, unless you come to the rural conference, in which case they charge you $290 a night, something about tenacious negotiation. At this conference, you will hear uh, a different range of big thinkers, uh, the Bill Bonners, the Doug Casey's, the Jim Rickards, the Daniela DiMartino Booths, big thinkers to be sure, but not the kind that you'd see at CBC or CNBC. You will also find, uh, if you agree with that worldview, some of the best analysts and portfolio managers in the world around natural resources. People who 10 years ago could spell uranium, not the Johnny come latelys. Much more importantly, I think, uh, you will come in contact with the people that we call the living legends, entrepreneurs who have built multi billion dollar natural resource companies from scratch talking about how the process of building those companies made them better investors and the lessons that they learned that can make you a better investor. Two, at this conference, you will come in contact with 60 listed company exhibitors. At most investment conferences, the qualification to be an exhibitor is a pulse and a check that cashes in reverse order of importance. At our conference, to be a public company exhibitor, you have to be owned in accounts owned or managed by the conference sponsors. Sadly, that's no uh, <laughs> guarantee that the stock goes up. It is not true that every stock I ever bought went up. What is true is that to be an exhibitor at our conference, we have to know about you, enough about you, that we have invested our time and treasure in you. We are confident enough in the educational product around our virtual and physical conferences that anyone who pays the tuition fee to attend either, should they not think that they got their money's worth, can request by email a refund, and there is a no-questions-asked money-back guarantee. I can't give you back four, four days of your life if you come to Boca Raton, but if you don't think that I gave you your money's worth, if you ask me, I'll give you your money back. In 30 years of providing investment products, uh, investment education products, uh, I've always had a money-back guarantee, and I've had to refund substantially less than one half of 1% uh, of the tuitions that we've charged over 30 years. So I, I hope that that has given people uh, an incentive to pay attention if they care about natural resources to either our virtual or our physical conference. I can tell you, too, uh, that if coming to Boca Raton, July 23rd to 27th, isn't useful, but you think the curriculum might be, we will live stream this conference. So if rather than coming to Boca Raton, particularly if you live outside the United States, you would like access to the information without spending four days of your life at Boca Raton, you can come to Boca, you, you can enjoy the live stream. And if you are a live stream subscriber or a physical subscriber, 
uh, you can utilize and enjoy uh, recordings of the conference for six months after the conference date. We'll work you 12 hours a day for four straight days. It's an awful lot to absorb. And being able to absorb it again over time at your leisure is very worthwhile. No, absolutely. Um, it sounds uh, it sounds amazing. And of course, I will put links in the show notes for these two events. But I also want for full disclosure, because I was informed of this earlier today, that there might actually be a benefit for, for the podcast if they use those links. So I want people to know that. But hopefully that's actually an even more better incentive. So if you want to support the podcast of what we do for free for you, uh, then definitely go to the show notes page and make sure you uh, sign up for either of the events or both of them. I'm sure it will be many times worth the investment. Now, Rick, this has really been a tremendous conversation. I hope and I think we we kind of talked about things that you don't uh, speak about uh, too often on, on other podcasts. I thought this was uh, a lot of fun and, and very insightful. And I want to ask everyone to go and sign up for the events uh, because, as you can tell from today's conversation, we are living in a truly global macro and commodity-driven world. And it is perhaps more important than ever before to stay well informed. From Jim and me, thank you so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you as we continue our Global Macro Series. And in the meantime, as usual, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.